On behalf of VMUG, I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast, Enterprise Class Software Defined Storage, presented by Gaurav Yadav and Christopher Hill of Hedvig. Thank you for participating in today's webcast and for your continued support in the Global VMUG program. Before we begin, I have three quick housekeeping items. First, today's webcast will be recorded and available for on-demand. You'll receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast, so be looking out for that. Second, a Q&A session will follow today's presentation. All questions will need to be entered in the question window near the bottom of your GoToWebinar screen. Third, there will be a short online evaluation that pops up as you exit the webcast. Please make sure to take a minute and let us know what you thought of today's session and what you might like to see going forward. All right, let's get started. I would like to introduce you to today's presenters. Garb Yadav, Founding Engineer and Product Manager, and Christopher Hill, Vice President of Field Engineering at Hedvig. Garb, I would like to turn things over to you. Great, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Annie, for the introduction. I appreciate that. My name is Gaurav, and uh, first of all, thanks everyone for joining this webcast. Uh, my name is Gaurav, and uh, I have uh, Christopher with me on the line as well. And uh, both of us will try to shed. Hey, hey, Christopher. Uh, both of us will try to shed some light on the topic of software-defined storage in the cloud era. And uh, as mentioned, feel free to submit any questions that you might have at any point of time, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the webcast. Now let me kick things off uh, with the agenda itself. So we'll start with discussing virtualization itself and how storage comes into the picture. Then we'll discuss software-defined storage and uh, what role Hedwig plays with it, and some real-world use cases, uh, followed by the demo. And uh, at the end, of course, we'll have some Q&A. So let's get started. So virtualization in the cloud era, what are we even talking about here? The three components, the three major components in any data center are storage, compute, and network. So these are the resources that we are trying to optimize the best we can. So what are the goals for virtualization in the cloud era? We're talking about on-demand and instant resource provisioning. Self-service is one of the key requirements where users should not have to file a large amount of paperwork or wait in the queue to consume resources. This requires automation and orchestration capabilities from the virtualization platform. Second, consumption-based model. Just like a public cloud, IT departments should have granular control over resource consumption. Using a centralized management console, one should be able to figure out what resources are being consumed, who is consuming them, and in what quantity. Simple and seamless scaling. As your infrastructure expands, you'll have to add more resources such as compute, RAM, and storage. And so far, IT departments either own resources for the infrastructure or always have the risk of running into platforms scaling limits. Products like Dropbox providing unlimited cloud storage for your file storage needs or Google Photos offering unlimited photos for free, it's, it's kind of mandatory for solutions these days to seamlessly scale as the resource consumption grow. And then multi-tenancy. It should be trivial to provision resources for different environments such as development, tests, or production independently and securely using that same platform. One should be able to instantiate multiple computing environments, create isolated networks if needed, and carve out storage as per the user needs. So when we are talking about compute network and storage, we, are, we have already been virtualizing compute for a while. Hyper, Hypervisor-based solutions like VMware have already, be, already been providing an efficient way to maximize the utilization of your compute resources. For networking, we have seen a lot of software-defined networking, which can provide a centralized view of the entire network. It can even abstract the control and data planes and provide flexibility in provisioning physical as well as virtual network devices from a central location. And it also provides a control to distribute security and policy information consistently throughout the enterprise. So compute and network we have already seen. Now what we are discussing today is storage. Now, storage has traditionally been one of the most expensive and complex components of any data center. In the cloud era, expectations from enterprise storage provider has completely changed. Let's consider a few of them. So what we are talking about here is, for example, 
my VMs deserve a cloud treatment, which means I should be able to provision a storage on demand for my VMs. Volumes need to be thinly provisioned. I should be able to extend volume size if needed, change the performance characteristics uh, based on my workloads, and release the storage when I'm done with my VM. The storage should be accessible anywhere and literally everywhere. It should, uh, I should be able to access my storage from any location, just like I can do that for public cloud storage. I should be able to set up a storage platform which enables me to run VMs from any site. There should be no more need for installation of multiple storage clusters or appliances at different sites anymore. I think it's pretty much redundant uh, kind of to say that it should be always on or highly available. Uh, for example, if your applications like Gmail or Twitter are unavailable for even for a few seconds, the whole social media starts buzzing. So high availability, it needs to come standard when it's with any storage solution. No application can afford to be offline anymore, even for a few seconds. Do I need a PhD to handle storage? So initially, software-defined and software-only storage solutions were deemed as too complex when they begin. Uh, they're too complex to deploy, painful to manage and scale. Uh, businesses should not have to deal with these complex storage solutions. They should focus on their applications and not exactly maintaining the storage infrastructure itself. And that can be achieved through storage, workflow, automation, self-healing architectures. So these are the keys in implementing or kind of taking out all the complexity out of any storage management. Now, containers. You might have heard uh, even VMware introduced this vSphere integrated containers because people are slowly uh, trying out containers, migrating towards containers, and you need a mechanism to run containers and VMs using the same platform, and VMware has already provided that as well. But when it comes to running stateful containers, you shouldn't have to install another container-only storage or container-native storage which is separate from your uh, storage for your VMware requirements. A storage platform should be able to suffice the need for your virtualization as well as container needs. So what are the different issues that you need to consider when you're trying to look for a storage solution for your virtualization platform? One of the key things is mixed workloads. Storage systems for virtualization are generally designed with a certain type of workloads in mind, such as primary storage for databases, machine learning and AI applications, or for secondary storage requirements such as backup and archive. But what if workload, requir workload requirements change? Maybe uh, we, we want iSCSI protocol as well, along with the NFS support for your volumes. Uh, do, we, do we need to look for other storage solution when that happens? or install a brand new cluster? Can your storage solution adapt to the new workload requirements? The second thing is performance. The same, um, similar to mixed workloads, in fact, uh, you design a storage cluster for a certain performance characteristics, some read-write read, write, read write IOPS and throughputs in mind as required by your applications. Now problems happen when more VMs are added to any given host, or for example, vMotion from another host, or maybe your current application require higher IOPS now. In, that, in those kind of scenarios, your VM performance will start degrading if the storage solution is not capable of dynamically handling such, handling such requirements. Now the storage architecture itself. Now this is a big deal because there are a lot of options to choose from. Traditionally, uh, these architectures were like, started from direct attached storage, uh, SAN and NAS solutions, which are a storage area network and network attached storage. And even from deployment point of view, you have the options of hyper-converged architectures where compute and storage coexist in the same set of servers and always scale together. And the second deployment architecture is a uh, hyper-scale where compute and storage are in independent of each other and al also scale independently. Now you need to be careful when selecting these architectures as different workloads might be suitable for different architectures and it might be hard to adapt uh, in future if your requirements change again. Hardware innovations itself. I mean, in your, is this storage solution tied to a specific hardware? 
Uh, what if uh, you need to migrate to a newer and faster SSD or NVMe or some higher network card with 40 gig or 100 gig speed or even servers with a significantly high number of cores? Can your storage solution leverage this new hardware and upgrade its capability and, and be more feature-proof uh, going forward? So these are a few of the things that you have to keep in mind when designing or thinking about a storage solution. And from the enterprise point of view, uh, what uh, what has happened in last few years or what has evolved in last few years in this cloud era, let's discuss a few of these things. So we start with digital transformation itself. So digital transformation is all about changing how your business operates and delivers value to the customers. How fast your business can adopt new technologies and uh, stay ahead of the competition. And cloud is inevitably at the heart of this transformation with its promise of a significant reduction in the time to market for new features. Security, in this day and age, every enterprise is either handling consumer data or the proprietary data that it cannot afford to leak or lose. Uh, security is a must have feature for any data management solution these days. Now, everyone must have noticed these GDPR regulations or data sovereignty uh, regulations being put in place over the last few years, and which made it imperative for storage solutions to provide guarantees for data re residents. And to achieve this declaratively and without any external intervention, it will be the key uh, feature for any data management solution going forward. Now, with the cloud journey, or maybe you can call it cloud migration that has been going on for the past uh, few years, it's not safe to say the future is hybrid. For years to come, data will be spread out across a combination of multiple locations, such as on-premise data centers, private cloud providers, or public cloud providers. You will have your data spread out across these different sites, and you have to work with a hybrid IT or a hybrid cloud uh, mindset. And it will be even more important to blur the lines between these disparate locations and provide a consistent experience, not just for your own business, but for your customers as well. So just like cloud, um, in cloud, you, have, uh, you don't have to worry about the hardware itself. The cloud providers are hardware agnostic. The same concept needs to be applied to the enterprise where data management solutions need to be workload agnostics and make the, si make the life simpler for end users. Because what happens is you end up buying multiple solutions or data management solutions targeted for specific applications and end up introducing these silos in the data centers. And it significantly increases your operating expenses. So using more of a workload agnostic solution, you can cut down on these costs just like uh, public cloud providers uh, provide you that capability. Legacy systems. Now, traditionally, enterprises used to get stuck in the vicious cycle of buying these uh, large monolithic solutions which needed to be upgraded frequently and eventually migrate to a different solution using lift and shift, lift and shift approach. More modern or software-defined solutions are now capable of standardizing on commodity servers and eliminating this rip and replace approach or rip and replace path altogether. So these, this is how the needs have evolved and this is what will kind of dictate what kind of solution you deploy in your data centers. Yeah, and Gaurav, you know, this yeah. is Christopher. What I what I'd say about that is that each of these elements on its own is a, is a pretty substantial driver in favor of policy driven software defined approaches, whether that's to networking or storage or the compute architecture. But I think that there's a broad intersection between these elements as well. Uh, as we try to reduce silos, as we try to bring legacy apps forward into a more software defined play, GDPR takes on a much broader role. Our back takes on a much broader role. So these things are, are not just working on their own as different drivers for, for true policy-based SDS, but are, but are intersecting with each other and really intensifying some of those concerns and needs. Right, great. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the input, uh, Chris. So yeah. let me now uh, move towards Hedwig and what, what we are trying to do based on these needs uh, that we have seen in the market or in this cloud era, uh, how the things have changed or how we have seen 
the market has evolved over these last few years and why Hedwig was needed and why it's solving these uh, problems in a, in, a, in a very unique manner. So our, our mission at Hedwig is to make enterprise storage cloud easy. Everything in your enterprise should be, you should get the same experience as you get with public cloud providers. And starting from resiliency, it, it just a uh, no brainer that your uh, enterprise infrastructure has to be as resilient as you would expect from public cloud providers of four or five nines and six nines availability. It has to be always on and to enable this business continuity, it has to be self-healing uh, self -healing and it should be able to sustain any kind of failures like disk failures or network failure or node failures, or even the entire data center or, or availability zone failures. This is the feature of the modern uh, enterprises going forward. And this is what we are trying to do at Headway. It, it is flexible, so we provide uh, tailored policies for changing business needs, which mean when you, can, when you create a volume using Headway, at that point you can dictate what that volume should look like, what the different characteristics of that volume should look like. It's completely flexible based on your performance requirements or based on what kind of workload you're running, be it primary storage or secondary storage requirement that you might have. It's agile, it's uh, self-service. We provide a lot of uh, easy to use interfaces. We provide web interface uh, to consume storage, uh, consume and manage storage. We provide a client uh, uh, CLI uh, and uh, we also provide REST-based APIs. Uh, so that you can in easily integrate with your existing workflows and uh, you do not have to go through this huge learning curve to implement anything. And it's self-service, it's simple, it is secure, uh, security is built in, and uh, this simply accelerates your time to market for your business. It's secure, so we have uh, RBAC built in, encryption is uh, provided in motion as well as at rest. And uh, this all comes as standard with the software. There are no different licenses. There is no uh, any extra fees that you have to pay for any of these features. It all comes built into the product. Cost efficient, that's one of the uh, key component of, uh, of Hedwig. We run on commodity hardware. We provide a lot of uh, advanced storage reduction capabilities like uh, global deduplication and compression and we have been saving our customers a significant amount of CapEx and OpEx by 60% or more already. So Hedwig Distributed, Distributed Storage Platform is itself, what does it look like or how does it install? It installs on, uh, it can be installed on any commodity x86 server or cloud services. So Hedwig is a completely software-based solution, uh, completely hardware agnostic, and you can bring in either bring in any hardware of your choice, or uh, we also provide an option of uh, uh, delivering a complete appliance, which is a hardware uh, plus software solution directly from Hedwig. And uh, there are three different ways uh, Hedwig software itself can be deployed, which is one is completely on the bare metal itself, uh, can be deployed, deployed as virtual instances in the cloud, or it can even be deployed as Docker containers, as I'll discuss uh, in in just few seconds, and uh, this this enables you. And in fact, this scales to. There is no limitation on number of nodes. So you can scale to thousands of nodes and even petabytes of data. It is simple. It it just unifies different kind of storage protocols, and uh, it's flexible in terms of it can be deployed on any public cloud, any hypervisor or container. Let me uh, give you a little more details on that. So in terms of Protocols itself, Hedwig supports all these different traditional protocols, which is block, file, and object. From block point of view, we support iSCSI and uh, OpenStack Cinder. And file, we have NFS. And for object storage, there is AWS S3 integration and uh, uh, OpenStack Swift as well. And uh, that allows us to support these different kind of workloads and be a good fit for primary as well as secondary storage requirements. And if you see in this slide at the bottom side, it's any deployment, which is we can support a private cloud deployment where you can install Hedwig in your data centers, one or more data center, and treat it like one big private cloud. And it's different from a lot of other uh, solutions where 
it's not simply a, a view of different Hedwig clusters in your different sites. It's inherently a one single scalable uh, data fabric that is deployed across multiple sites and using Hedwig UI, you are able to visualize all the storage resources and consume it as if all of them are, are your local storage instances. So that's a little different on or kind of the unique aspect of what Hedwig does. It consolidates all these distant resources or disparate resources and provides a unified view. And the tree, you can, as a consumer, you can treat, as, treat it as pretty much like a local storage. It, it could be hybrid cloud. You can have on-prem as well as any cloud uh, uh, installation for Hedwig, be it uh, AWS, Azure, or even the Google Cloud. And you can have a completely cloud-only installation as well, or a completely multi-cloud installation in any of these cloud vendors. And uh, you can also uh, enable um, um, your resistance for uh, availability zones or zones and region failures as well in the cloud uh, using Hedwig software directly or natively. Now, talking about the workloads, Hedwig can support uh, as I mentioned, any of these uh, uh, hardwares, um, any of these hardware providers, be it Cisco or Supermicros or HP, you can bring in hardware for x86 servers from any of these vendors, and or you can bring in uh, any of these cloud providers as well, uh, AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud, Google Cloud, and we can be in installed on them and consolidate storage resources spanning your on-prem or cloud location. And from workload point of view, there are three different buckets that we'll talk about. One is uh, virtualization, where Hedwig provides integration with the VMware, Hyper-V, and KVM hypervisors. And also, Hedwig provides uh, integration with OpenStack private cloud installations, uh, which is uh, OpenStack Cinder for block and OpenStack Swift for object storage. Hedwig is doing a lot with containers for a long, long period of time already. Uh, for the last few years, in fact, we were literally the first uh, Docker certified volume plugin uh, for Docker certified software defined storage plugin uh, in the Docker store. And we have integrated with Kubernetes, we have integrated with Mesosphere, we work with uh, Red Hat OpenShift as well. So, and we already have customers using us for container native storage deployments. And the third one is backup. So this is more in the secondary storage space. So we provide a lot of integration with these uh, well-known backup applications. So we already provide Veritas uh, OST certified plugin so that you can uh, natively use uh, Hedwig storage from uh, net backup and uh, get much better performance for your backups and restores. And we are also a Veeam certified backup repository solution. And we also have, we also work with Commvault and provide uh, uh, detailed solution guides on the deployments. So these are the different buckets uh, in terms of use case uh, that Hedwig supports. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Gaurav, when I look at a slide yeah. like this, I think one of the important notes here, because, you know, it's it's rare to think, okay, I'm going to run virtualization and containers and backup on, on the same platform and the same fabric. And most shops are certainly not going to deploy Lenovo and HP and, you know, Dell all in the same kind of go round. But I, I think it suggests something important, which is that all of our environments are evolving aggressively right now. Uh, even on VMware centric uh, applications or uh, sites where people are pushing toward Photon and evaluating containers there, a lot of heterogeneous workloads that that are very dynamic ultimately. And I, I think it's important for any modern storage platform that's going to be that's going to be always on, and it's going to be, you know, persistent and, uh, you know, provide universal uptime. That it be able to evolve along with the hardware underneath that platform as people transition from Lenovo to Dell to HPE, uh, as they transition into the cloud in a hybrid way. And it's important that they maintain that always on fabric as the workloads themselves above above the fabric transition. So. So it really is about an always on model or a universal model, not just at a point in time, but as workloads evolve. And that, that's really, really key as we look at FDS. Right, right, great. Yeah, thanks for adding more life to it. Uh, moving forward, just quickly uh, covering on uh, how Hedwig Fabric works. 
So Hedwig is a two-tier architecture, and uh, it has two major components. One is a Hedwig storage service, which sits at the storage layer, and it is responsible for striping the data across your private or public cloud, depending on your deployment. It is, in fact, the brain behind the distributed storage cluster and is responsible for managing the data stored in all the cluster nodes. So Hedwig Storage Service is literally installed in each and every storage node and manages all the locally storage, uh, locally attached storage on all of those nodes and presents a virtual list abstraction. As you see in the slide, you see three different volumes, VI, VJ, and VK of, in fact, three different types. One is iSCSI, another one is NFS, and the third one is S3. So from the same platform, you are able to consume these different kind of uh, volumes and the storage layer remains exactly the same. And uh, the second component in this architecture is Hedwig Storage Proxy. And it runs at the application tier. Uh, and it's responsible for uh, talking northbound to your applications and southbound to our Hedwig Storage Service or Hedwig Storage Layer. And it translates uh, your your protocol, it, it does a protocol conversion, for example, uh, iSCSI or NFS or S3. These Hedwig Storage Proxy is the first point of contact for all the IOs, and it translates those protocols and uh, reroutes the data to our Hedwig backend. And uh, then, of course, Hedwig Storage Service takes care of the data and, and, it, and it stripes it out. And uh, Hedwig Storage Proxy, in fact, is also responsible for um, a couple of uh, caching mechanisms that we deploy at the application tier. One of them is the client-side cache for your enhanced read performance. Uh, we can consume any of the higher-end uh, uh, disks like SSDs or NVMEs uh, at your compute tier or application tier uh, for uh, for your higher performance requirements because what you might have is you, you might want to run certain VMs which are more mission critical with higher performance needs and some other VMs which may not be as uh, we, which may not have as high, high as high performance requirements. So you can tailor uh, these VMs uh, because you can uh, change the characteristics of the volume uh, when you create using Hedwig, uh, Hedwig storage layer. And uh, this uh, combining these two components, uh, what you get is a Hedwig uh, storage which presents VDisk and are managed, as I mentioned, using these granular po policies uh, and the uh, Christopher will show you a quick demo and you will get a better visual picture of uh, what that looks like and what are those different policies uh, that you can tailor per as per volume level, uh, be it com uh, compression, deduplication, or encryption, or even number of copies of the data, or where exactly you want those copies of data to reside. So just to uh, sum it up before I hand it over to Christopher uh, for the uh, rest of the presentation, Hedwig, what is Hedwig providing for your virtualization use case. It, it provides enterprise-grade features at VM granularity like uh, compression, deduplication, as I just mentioned. Um, and uh, it enables edge caching, at again, at, at VM level for performance requirements. Uh, it, you get the flexibility to use iSCSI or NFS for VM attached storage because you never know what kind of applications you may need to run at, uh, inside your VMs and they might have different storage requirements or different protocol requirements for that matter. You can have declarative data sovereignty at the VM level again, that when you create the uh, volume, you dictate where exactly the data should reside. So you might have uh, Hedwig, you might have deployed Hedwig on-prem as well as public cloud location. And when you create the volume, you dictate where the data should reside and what boundaries it should not cross. So you can get those GDPR and data sovereignty easily implemented uh, when you create Hedwig volumes. And you get VM level analytics as well. So we have a cloud-based analytics platform called Pensi, and you can get a lot of uh, uh, metrics around your VM uh, using that, uh, that platform. And it's capable of running, you can run these virtual machines on-prem as well as cloud because of our private hybrid and multi-cloud deployments. And we also have a scheduled snapshot management for your VM. So you can periodically take a snapshots and uh, to enable this continuous incremental backups uh, for your VMs as well. So I think I'll, I'll wrap it up here and then pass over uh, the role to Christopher for the rest of the presentation.
Perfect. Thank you, Gaurav. I appreciate that. Um, and let me uh, start presenting here. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. There we go. Perfect. Um, yeah, you can see that. Fantastic. So uh, I wanted to focus on a few things. Uh, I'll take about 10 minutes uh, to to review uh, a set, uh, set of customers that have adopted Hedvig in a couple of different scenarios. And I think, you know, one of the things to really question or to really ask in, in this kind of situation is is why, right? There, we, we've got a lot of tools to solve technical problems and there's there's always a particular mindset when adopting specific approaches. And I, I think some of it for Hedvig is, is very tactical. It is the ability to reduce cost. Uh, it's the ability to, um, you know, really adopt a scale out approach, uh, to get elastic in what we're doing uh, to simplify operations. But I think as well, there's there's really a, a visionary aspect to what we're trying to do. And I think for for a number of our customers, um, you know, we, we, I'd say we've got a range. Those that are really solving a tactical problem right now, and then looking at the long term of whether there's a strategic match. And then we've got a set of customers that's really being transformative, and almost asking the question, if you will, um, you know, what would Google do? What would Amazon do? How would they solve this problem? And I think it's one of the first times when when we can really be able to answer that question as as customers, as uh, as IT managers, as as CIOs, uh, and have a, a robust answer for that, which is you know they would do it this way. So three real use cases that kind of align with that, uh, and I won't focus heavily on backup and archive, although we'll review a couple of logos. Um, you know, back up an archive much more tactical, although there's great value to it and great strategic alignment, um, will grow from from that kind of space into how people are truly modernizing. And then look at a couple of applications where, you know, whether it's VMware or, or Hyper-V or some other virtualization tool where people are really being forward thinking and beginning to to really uh, engage in some some broad transformation that's quite powerful. So when I look at the backup space, uh, again, some great global companies, strong logos, uh, Scania, um, a, uh, a subsidiary of Volkswagen uh, uh, out of Europe, uh, pushing for Veeam-based uh, VMware backups uh, to a, a really powerful scale-out fabric uh, that's eliminating forklift upgrades for them, uh, putting them in a position to scale very elastically and giving them an opportunity strategically to evaluate SDS and begin to roll some production VMs in that space uh, to see how that can evolve for them over the long term. Um, LKAB, a very similar scenario, although they're leveraging that backup primarily. Um, and in their center, in their case, they are executing that backup, um, uh, uh, archiving and backup onto Hedvig. Uh, but pushing that data not just on site or to a secondary location because we're natively multi-site, but pushing it out into the public cloud as well through that same approach. So really treating that on-prem and public cloud real estate as a single consistent whole uh, for, for really robust protection and beginning to, to look at uh, how they can, uh, you know, how they can leverage that for production as well. But first, you know, simple tactical use case, uh, back up the disk behind that backup. Um, and then most recently uh, selected by uh, Ernst & Young as their global uh, platform for VMware-based backups using Veeam uh, for on-premises. And for them, that native ability to carry data out across multiple facilities, uh, provide instantaneous, really efficient off-site protection for those very modern backup footprints leveraging Veeam, uh, it was a, a real powerful indicator. But I'd say in each one of these cases, these, these customers, although they're really tackling what can be a tactical problem in terms of backup and recovery, uh, are also looking to what the long-term um, opportunity is in a software-defined storage area. So focusing in on a couple of key customers that are using us in production, um, uh, Pittsburgh State University, a small institution, um, although much larger than the college I went to, a uh, small institution out of uh, southeastern Kansas, uh, 7,500 students, uh, very VMware-centric uh, organization using traditional arrays uh, in a dual site architecture historically. Uh, they were looking to, to really modernize in their 
um, technical center. They've got a center of excellence that's a real model for some of the other institutions in Kansas. Um, and looking to begin asking that question of how do I really break out of the physical boundaries of the data center and move from a from a DR or a disaster recovery mode, um, which they had in place with a third site out at Wichita State, um, into a true HA model. Um, and what we what we did for them and, and what's in place today is a true multi-site fabric. Uh, where they've taken their two on-center, on-campus data centers, uh, Kelsey and Axe, uh, and woven those together with a third data center that's at Wichita State into a single consistent storage fabric where we're sharing data stores out across those three facilities um, in an active, active state uh, and allowing them to run individual VMs, uh, a single centralized VMware cluster at any of the three facilities at will. Uh, whether the, the VMs are bouncing around because of DRS, VMware HA, or uh, because they're being voluntarily moved through a, a standard migration, uh, but a single consistent uh, global namespace for storage uh, across multiple sites, three sites, to ensure that they've got what's operationally become a single global virtual data center. Um, and in this scenario, uh, just you know, minor detail, they've got about a one millisecond delay between their two primary data centers and about four milliseconds round trip out to uh, Wichita State. So it's really an ideal regional scenario um, you know, that you might find in any number of academic institutions, uh, healthcare centers, local conglomerates, et cetera, uh, where you can really begin to think beyond those traditional boundaries of, of single arrays, single data centers, uh, from, a, from an HA perspective and an always-on perspective. So real simplification here for Pittsburgh State coupled with uh, an availability model or a resilience model that simply wasn't available uh, several years ago in the market. Um, also VMware focused, um, you know, one of the, the some of the, the three things that Gaurav called out, resilience is obviously a big piece of that and doing multi-rack or multi-site frameworks is, is a big piece of the puzzle, but the other elements really include being able to self-heal, uh, being able to achieve full resilience or full data protection, even after you have component loss, uh, being able to scale in a very automated, predictable way, um, you know, get to almost staffless operations from a resiliency perspective. Those are some of the core functions that uh, were in play for GE Digital uh, in uh, selecting Hedvig as support for their on-premise predict system. And this is for a customer in Eastern Europe, uh, major installation uh, in, a, in a dark site, secure bunker where Hedvig can't uh, send staff and GE Digital is fairly restricted as well. So the requirement in a, in a hyper-converged VMware footprint was to be able to provide that kind of self-healing storage fabric with very programmable, easily automated self-service to, to really streamline operations for, uh, for the customer. And in this scenario, even in the VMware footprint, they're, they're looking at containers, uh, whether it ends up being Photon or something else running above that, uh, like a Kubernetes or like a Mesos, et cetera. Uh, but the ability for Hedvig to craft two data centers together as a single entity for far more robust protection, deliver that as a self-healing fabric at large scale. So 240 nodes between the two data centers woven together as a single fabric that is uh, a single uh, global namespace from a storage perspective uh, with the ability to deliver NFS for standard uh, kernel-based uh, uh, data source for the virtualization workloads object for long-term storage of data that flows through this system uh, and iSCSI in some cases directly into VMs for, um, uh, for specific use cases and specific applications. So really robust multi-protocol support, self-healing, highly automated fabric at a very large scale beyond what you typically see from, from SDS players in a hyper-converged world. Um, but in some ways still very I don't want to say pedestrian. It's actually quite impressive what, what we're doing and what they're doing, uh, but but uh, not so transformational that it makes us think uh, uh, that that it's something. Uh, you know, I would say it's it's still not enforcing that question. What would Google do? If we look at a couple of our other customers, and this begins to think beyond a, a truly VMware-centric space where they are adopting VMware 
and Hyper-V and OpenStack and uh, OpenShift uh, from Red Hat or Kubernetes, those types of applications. Um, the ability to, again, in a very automated, very simple way to deliver self-healing private clouds in support of a range of evolving workloads, that kind of capability has, has proven itself to be very attractive to uh, a range of, of sizes and a range of customers. So for Airbus Defense and Space, we are, are deeply embedded and, uh, you know, this is a, um, you know, a fairly massive project actually in delivering their uh, infrastructure as a service for a number of defense customers in EMEA, in the European theater. Um, again, um, you know, heavy virtualization, uh, some VMware, some Hyper-V, uh, Azure Stack as a component, then server and support of VDI, coupled with OpenShift, uh, all with a, a single fundamental storage namespace distributed across multiple racks and multiple rows to enhance availability, uh, all fully programmed so that from the ground up, once they have ILO, uh, again, it's a touchless architecture for, for rapid deployment, rapid elasticity and scaling, et cetera. So really powerful, you know, programmable architecture that is, is part and parcel of a software defined as an approach, whether that's a very VMware centric software defined uh, compute layer, whether it's something like NSX at the network layer or something like Hedvig to provide that same kind of elasticity, uh, data portability, et cetera, from a, uh, from a storage perspective. And, you know, these are things that traditional arrays simply can't accomplish because they're designed in a, um, in a single site model, very powerful, great high availability out of traditional arrays. I've, I've deployed many myself, uh, but as we start looking toward that virtual data center beyond the physical box or beyond the you know, individual rack or the individual array, um, it's something where SDS is a, is a real key player for that. Um, and then before we step into a demo on the Hedvig side, I, I think the last uh, uh, customer I'd like to raise uh, and again, this is perhaps the most transformative of the customers that I've worked with, uh, a global airline executing a hybrid cloud where on-prem and uh, public cloud pieces need to play together and work together effectively, uh, reducing a footprint of about 25 data centers today, six subsidiary airlines, all with different solutions and high technical debt into a, a single consistent global virtual data center that is spread across um, three physical data centers in Europe, uh, three Azure regions and three WS regions, all with the ability to push a, a, a global storage workspace that's policy driven, where you can select the specific sites, the specific redundancy and resiliency that you're looking for, uh, specific performance parameters, um, all from a policy driven approach. And this, I think at the end of the day, is something we may not all be doing next week, but ultimately we are pushing toward this greater sense of data portability, this greater sense of, of true resilience, not only across individual component failures or node failures, but across full data center outages and even full vendor outages. So this kind of approach is something which, um, you know, truly begins to answer that question, you know, what would Google do? Uh, what would Amazon do? And, and this is, is what they do today. They distribute data geographically for additional protection. They give themselves a, an availability model, which is no longer fully dependent on individual data centers and sites, uh, and position themselves really to begin to operationalize workloads uh, in, in global virtual footprints that are, that are really powerful and once in place, you know, truly simplistic from an operational perspective. So that's what the SDS uh, solution should be able to do for you. That's what they should be pushing for is that, that true level of abstraction or uh, true abstraction benefit uh, from the, the physical underpinnings of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the assets themselves. So I'll stop there for a moment. Um, I'm gonna move into a demo phase. I know we've got some questions that are coming up. I'll try and move swiftly through a couple of um, um, VMware centric elements within the demo so that you've got a good perspective of, um, you know, ignoring some of the programmable assets where APIs are in play, 
what are we really doing from a from a cluster perspective, and, and how does that uh, uh, how does that ch show for for an end user customer? So I'll look at two clusters today. The first is our smallest uh, configuration possible, which is three individual nodes. Uh, and if we dig into one of these nodes, we can see at uh, grayback three here that we've got uh, an individual host. In this case, it's a demo machine. It's fairly small. It's got six 1.8 terabyte drives that we've woven as individual JBOD objects into a really advanced uh, uh, storage database that we maintain on the back end that allows us to address individual blocks, uh, individual storage containers across a, a wide variety of assets. So this, these happen to be physical servers living in Santa Clara. Uh, we, these could easily be Amazon containers or Google containers with appropriate storage underneath. Um, and certainly could be virtualized uh, on, in a hyper-converged way, although this isn't. Um, our responsibility as a, a software stack is to take these three individual nodes and combine those into a single storage pool and then allocate storage across that footprint um, in an elastic way by policy. So uh, adding servers should be non-disruptive, removing servers should be non-disruptive, applying updates to the to the firmware and to the OSs should be non-disruptive. And that's what we work to achieve. So if we look at that context, not at a, a single site system here, which is only three nodes, maybe all living in one rack, but at a, a broader multi-site kind of framework, uh, imagine taking that same approach and allocating your storage, um, your, your individual nodes, not at a single facility, uh, but potentially in multiple racks that are defined by policy potentially at multiple data centers defined by policy. And al although this is an empty cluster, um, the, the re representation here, SNC1 is a given data center, two is a given data center, and three is a given data center. Those could be on-prem, they could be in the cloud, they could be some kind of blend. In this case, they're all sitting hyper-converged on a, on a set of uh, VMware hosts out in California. Uh, so how do we take that and craft it as storage? What does that abstraction look like? Uh, you know, what, is, what are our options here? So I'm going to go under virtual disk management and add a component or add a disk. Um, and the VDisk or virtual disk is our you know, kind of core abstraction layer and our core uh, level of granularity when we look at uh, what's possible within the fabric. So you can see on screen, actually, if I do this as a test for vMug, um, we will be using, um, you know, some arbitrary size here. Everything that we allocate on the back end, uh, because it's so so built for large scale and capacity. Everything we do is thinly provisioned. Uh, we'll never allocate a block on the back end until we're actually writing blocks there. But we'll create our metadata framework for this volume. Uh, let's say this is a hundred gig volume. We can choose to make that iSCSI uh, on a, from a block basis. We can choose to make that NFS. Uh, via our API, we can craft that as an object store as well, um, not something people generally work with in the GUI. Um, in this kind of scenario, uh, selecting block type is simple. The other enterprise features that you would want to be available on a, on a granular per volume basis are all here as well. Uh, encryption, uh, that's AES 256-bit encryption that's defined on a volume by volume basis. Uh, all tied to an uh, external key management system that you would be running as an enterprise. Uh, the ability to optimize this for backup traffic in particular with a custom uh, set of integration, either Infinite Backup OST or using our own uh, garbage collection and optimization functions uh, to be able to do that uh, with heavy deduplication and then correlate our garbage cleanup and uh, optimization uh, cycle with the retention cycles on the particular backup volume that we're operating against. So really a nice ability to go optimize this for, for specific backup environments, which is, uh, you know, is a powerful use case for us, certainly. Um, deduplication itself uh, enabled uh, broadly within the product uh, global, no matter how many um, nodes we add, the ability to, to look at all of that as a single deduplication domain uh, and bring real, um, you know, real efficiency into the puzzle compared to some of our competitors is, uh, is, a, is a great benefit. Uh, and then, you know, some of the other elements that you would expect to see, the ability to compress, even if we're not deduplicating uh, on the back end, to enable client-side caching, uh, 
uh, Gaurav talked about our two components, the backend storage nodes, and then the proxy on the front end. We have the ability to leverage assets at the, that front end proxy to do uh, really effective read ahead caching, uh, local storage of the, the deduplication tables, the metadata tables, uh, to enable us to really optimize for, for high performance reads and uh, you know, really be efficient about how we're handling the backend network there. Um, other elements in terms of performance management, the ability to assign either flash or spinning disk as the, the terminal backend storage for a given volume on a case-by-case -case basis. Perhaps most important is the replication policy, and this is what really sets us apart. Uh, in a single site configuration, you'd simply be selecting the appropriate number of uh, replicas that you want to maintain, potentially two for something like backup to disk where um, you know, you've got to maintain a high degree of, uh, of protection, uh, but, you know, it's not what I'll call customer impacting mission critical front end data. Uh, but we've got the ability to set this from a replication factor of one, like a RAID zero stripe, uh, all the way up to six copies, depending on the criticality of a given uh, block or a given element. Um, that's relatively straightforward. But in this kind of scenario, we also have a data center aware config puts us in a position to determine, uh, again, by policy, where that data lives, um, where it's exposed, who has access to it. So in this kind of scenario, while we might have three data centers set up in this uh, system, perhaps one of those is in Amazon, and we have a data set that is only by policy permitted to live on-prem. Uh, maybe you know, one of these data centers is much more distant uh, and we don't want to get into any performance issues related to pushing data to that. Um, there are a lot of different uh, policy reasons why we might want to include uh, some data centers, but not others. In fact, if we look back at the configuration for uh, the global airline, uh, you know, clearly with this many data centers, we're not going to maintain nine copies of every block. That would be fairly wasteful. Uh, and not give them, um, you know, that much uh, of what they need given the, uh, the, uh, the amount of capacity requirement there, but they might want to select three of those in this kind of context uh, to make sure they're all on-prem or that they're bridging everything across all of Azure or across all three media. So really flexible capability in terms of how we, we allocate storage here. And that's, you know, that's the goal is to create that as a level of abstraction uh, and put us in a position to very simply be able to apply policies around all of the enterprise features uh, and around how and where we're protecting that data. Um, so that's relatively straightforward. Uh, all of that accessible by API as well, along with some of the, the I'll say some of the more non-standard allocation approaches. Uh, but not everyone wants to go into a GUI. And as we, we talk about how we're doing this within different um, uh, client uh, strata, uh, in, uh, I think Gaurav mentioned OpenStack Cinder, for example, uh, to automate that, you know, based on uh, storage creation in the OpenStack using the Cinder driver, to roll out data for Kubernetes using the uh, deployment uh, integration that's there uh, for automated provisioning. And in a vCenter world or in a, a, a v, uh, VMware specific approach, to be able to access uh, all of the functions for adding and configuring data stores within vCenter itself so that the storage layer becomes essentially plumbing underneath your primary, um, you know, kind of management framework. So all of those elements that we looked at uh, for that test VM are, are here and available uh, for, um, uh, for a VMware allocation directly out of uh, vCenter. Uh, same rights and privileges from, uh, you know, selecting the different types of replication, uh, whether we're encrypting, whether we're compressing, et cetera. Uh, all tied easily into the vCenter uh, universe. Um, with a, a couple of other elements uh, involved, I think, um, and actually I'll go back here, uh, we talked a little bit in the uh, opening about the ability to set uh, schedules for VMware specific snapshots and VMware intelligence snapshots. Those are all based out of a, of a simple SLA domain framework. So you can see we've, we've crafted here uh, SLA domains with a frequency in terms of the number of minutes or the number of hours that snapshots will kick off and execute. Those are snapshots on the backend storage. Uh, they don't maintain persistent presence in the VMware snapshot tree. Um, and then a specific retention policy. 
And then it becomes trivial to take an individual VM and add it to a specific backend retention policy. So as we look at uh, you know, a couple of VMs here that are stored on uh, Hedvig storage, we've got a set of Hedvig actions that allows us to schedule snapshots via those SLA domains, execute snapshots manually against our backend um, footprint, uh, work with linked clones, et cetera, to do backend storage migrations. So a, a lot of really good functionality to offload uh, effort into the VMware, uh, into the uh, the Hedvig uh, uh, system as a kind of as a, a primary storage uh, uh, enhancement. So, so let me pause there uh, and I will come back just to a summary slide and let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, some of the questions that may be out there. Great. Um, thanks, Chris. I think we are uh, almost uh, running close to the time limit. So we have a couple of minutes left and we have a few questions. So let me uh, quickly uh, run through them and see and uh, try to answer as many as we can. So mm -hmm. let me start with the first one where it says, uh, can an on-prem SDS be accessed by an application running on a public cloud in a hybrid cloud environment? So eliminate the need for data migration when an app is migrated to a public cloud or vice versa. I think that's a very good question, and that's a, a kind of a, one of the unique proposition that Hedwig has in its uh, hybrid cloud or multi-cloud or multi-site deployments, where you can start ingesting data from any location, and where when your application migrates to another location, be it another site or another cloud location, you can still access the data. So because Hedwig Cluster has the intelligence to figure out where the data resides and transmits it or rehydrate it as needed when the application migrates to another location. And same applies for the VM migration as well. So when VM migrates from one host to another, the storage is always available and the Hedwig Cluster underneath the layer is managing that storage seamlessly without application even being aware of it. So the answer, short answer is yes. So the both ways it works. Uh, you can move applications from on-prem or to public cloud or public cloud to on-prem, but the data will always, you can always access the data from any of these locations. Yeah, so, and, and uh, I think I would even enhance that answer and say that the goal is to craft that and have that function as a single site, really a single virtual data center. So I don't even like the idea of the idea of moving data. I think it's really a function of uh, you know just standing up where we're accessing it and uh, making sure that we've got strong consistency across that, uh, that new virtual data center. Right. Um, there's uh, the second question. I'll direct it towards you, Chris. Uh, uh, feel free to answer that. Uh, can Hedwig Storage Proxy become the bottleneck? So yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, one of the things that I, I almost jumped up and highlighted at the uh, at the beginning of the call as we were talking about storage proxies. Um, Traditional arrays have a typically a pretty beefy storage controller. Uh, you know, maybe it's as a as a pair or maybe four you know four ports, etc. But fundamentally, it, it is a, a significant bottleneck in accessing some of the latent capabilities of a traditional array, and that it's just part of the architecture. There's nothing wrong with that. In our model, while the individual proxies are, are perhaps less powerful than you know an individual controller on a traditional array because we're leveraging uh, compute capability to, to provide that, it gives us an opportunity to scale those proxies nearly infinitely. So if we have a very large footprint, you know, if you've got you know, 100 uh, VMware hosts accessing a very large storage footprint on the back end, we can allocate as many storage proxies as we need to accommodate that linear scaling of the, of the front end performance. So we can really custom tune the, the amount of, uh, of, of uh, controller, you know, that we've got getting into and out of that backend system. It's a many-to-many -many approach and gives us an opportunity to really scale linearly, not just at the backend, but at that front-end controller as well. Right. And I'll just add that uh, we always deploy uh, as an active passive pair in a HA manner so that even if a uh, proxy goes down, the passive one takes over so that the storage is always available. Right. Um, there, there's an, uh, next one is, uh, do you provide your own file system as well? The answer is no. Uh, we provide, as we discussed in the presentation, a virtual disk abstraction. And we, sub we integrate with the, these traditional or most frequently used protocols like iSCSI, NFS, and S3 
In fact, we even expose APIs uh, such that there is, in fact, theoretically, you can even build your own file system for that matter. But in short, we do not provide our own file system. We provide the virtual disk abstraction and support integration with these standard protocols. And uh, uh, I think we have, uh, we just ran out of time, never mind. Um, sorry, uh, I think I'll hand over back to Annie. Hey, Annie. Great. Well, thank you so much, Grav and Christopher, for taking the time to speak to us today. As a reminder, you will all receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast. And to find out more about the VMUG webcast program, you can visit vmug.com forward slash learn. And please make sure to complete the short online evaluation that will pop up as you exit the webcast and let us know how you thought today's session went. And from all of us here at VMUG, thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.